place in heaven. Please don't sing sad songs for me. Forget your grief and tears. For I'm in a perfect place, away from pain and fears. I'm far away from hunger and hurt and want and cry. I have a place in heaven with the master at my side. My life on earth was a very good as earthly lives can go. But paradise is so much more than anyone can know. My heart is filled with happiness and sweet rejoicing too. To walk with God is perfect peace, a joy forever new. To turn to Bibles to John chapter 14, 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Folks, this morning, that's just the, not words. That is the Son of God telling us a promise. Um, before we hear our lesson, I have to, I have to uh, take time to thank a couple of people who made this possible. First and foremost, my lovely wife. I have to thank her for putting up with me for the last three weeks. Well, I actually put up with her for the last 24 years. But <laughs> the, the last three weeks especially, I've been a basket case and I haven't been a real good joy to be around but because of her love and her support and her prayers. For encouragement, I'm here, so I love you. Thank you very much. And I certainly have to thank, he's not here, but he's hearing this on tape this morning, Steve Biffin. He's, uh, I don't know if I should be mad. He's the one who talked me into this. <laughs> he's the one who prodded me, he encouraged me. We've had many hours of prayer. We talk, he called me at 4.30 this morning and prayed. I couldn't even talk to him. I was crying so much. So I hope I don't cry through this, but uh, this is a special moment. And I just want to thank Steve so much for all the prayers and all the encouragement he's brought me. He'll never realize how much he means to me. And I know at this time, they're, they're very, their hearts are sad that they've lost Doris. But as uh, Carol Powers brought to my attention with a special comment that Doris had her graduation. And it just so happens that we've talked about our Sunday school class today. It just takes the sting out of death when you think of it as a graduation instead of in the end. It's not the end, it's just the beginning. This morning, this is so far, so far out of my box, man. I, my comfort zone's about 12 miles that way, and I'm here, so you guys can do the math. So before we get started, let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, you're just such a truly awesome God. I thank you much, so much for this opportunity you've given me to share some thoughts that's been on my heart. Thank you for watching over us, Lord. I ask you to allow your Holy Spirit just to calm my nerves, to give me peace of mind, help me to remember the things that I, I want to say that I hope I don't forget to say. But Lord, as I Think about this day. It doesn't matter if I said another word today, Lord. You could, you know my heart, and I couldn't be more blessed when I look out at it. See my son sitting here with my granddaughter. It is such a, such a prayer, Lord. I just thank you so much for that. Thank you for being such an awesome God that you are, Lord. We just thank you so much. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Yeah. As I said, I want to share some things that have really been on my heart and my, in my mind lately, and uh, I'm going to share a couple of stories that really, extremely had a large impact on my life, and uh, without God, I would have not gone through, through those stories, I would have gone through those, through those times. If you'll turn to Hebrews 9, 27, move to the lesson. As it is appointed to men once to die, 
and after that, the judgment. I'm sorry, but it's not a real pleasant, exciting topic, but it's one that is going to affect everybody sitting in this auditorium today. And in order to get to the video that we saw, the, our final destination, there's something we have to do with it, and that is to die. And it doesn't matter what color you are, if you're a Republican, if you're a Democrat, doesn't matter how much money you have, doesn't matter where you choose to worship, it doesn't even matter if you don't even choose to worship. We're all having a point where we're all going to die. And certainly here at Mag Center, we've had our taste of that. We, uh, we're just now doing our new directory. I was going through a couple of the old directories we had at home, and I counted over 40 people who are no longer with us. And uh, that's, a, that's a frightening thought. But, but death is certainly no respecter of person with our family here at, at church. Death is, we've witnessed death to newborn babies, all the way to people who celebrated over a hundred birthdays on this earth. As I look at the young people up there and the ones sitting here, I know that if they're anything like me when I was that age, death was the farthest thing on my mind. I was invincible. I thought, well, okay, when I get 50, 60, 70 years old, I'll worry about that then, but we pick up a newspaper, we turn on the, on the television, and every day of our lives, we see children dying. We see children killing other children because of the color of clothes they wear, the type of sneakers they choose to wear. We see children going into schools and killing other kids just because maybe they had a bad day or they had a fight with their girlfriend. Just uh, two weeks ago, we saw, we read about a busload of children who just graduated from high school on their way to visit their new college, their potentially new college, never to return home again. We read about a ferry that is loaded with children on a destination that they never got to. So certainly, just because you're young doesn't mean death is not just around the corner. At any time, death is just an arm length away from each and every one of us. I can remember March 21st, 1992, like it was yesterday. I was at work on a Saturday morning, 4.30 in the morning, and I got a call from my mom. She said, Wayne, you need to go pick up Ginger and meet me at the hospital. Dad's been in a car accident. And I said, well, is it bad? And she says, well, I don't know that. The person at the hospital didn't say they were, said he was, in the, he was in the ambulance on his way to the hospital. So sure, we were panicking and I got Ginger and we went to the hospital. By the time we got there to the emergency room, I talked to the emergency room nurse and she said, well, they've already taken your father into surgery. And I said, well, can you give me some details? Is it, what is, what, is, what has happened? And he said, she said, all we know is the police said that someone had walked through a red light and broadside of my dad in a van, and that they had to uh, use the jaws of life to cut him out of the car, and that his legs were very, very bad off, and he was in emergency surgery for his legs. So for the next seven, eight hours, we, sit, we stood in the waiting room waiting and praying and hoping and thinking, well, if it's the worst thing that can happen, he loses his legs, then we still have my dad. And I can remember about seven hours after that, the doctor calls us into this little room, the whole family, I'm standing next to my mom, and he says, Mrs. Dittmore, there's a 95% chance that your husband won't make it through the night. And uh, sure enough, less than two hours later, my dad passed away. This is the first time, that was the first time that death had visited my immediate family. I had so many emotions going through my body, I couldn't even control them all. I was angry, I was scared, I was worried, I was worried about what's going to happen to my mom and to my sisters. And the only thing that got me through was God. I had a relationship with Him and I knew that, like I said, we're all going to face this in time. But I knew that he was, my dad was not suffering no more, he was in no pain, and he's in the presence of God. 
it still didn't take the pain away, but it certainly helped. I gotta explain to you, I, I was born and raised in the church. I attended church my whole life. I was baptized when I was 11. Every time the church doors were open, you knew where the Dittmore family was at. But there was a time in my life where I lost focus and I, I wasn't going to church. And during that time, and one of the, I had many reasons why I wasn't going, but the main reason is a friend of mine who was three years older than me, graduated from Pepperdine, and uh, became a youth minister in, in the late 70s, all during the 80s, during, in our brotherhood, he was the most sought after youth minister that there was. He uh, taught me lots and lots of wonderful things about life. I can remember sitting in the church building, attending his, going to his wedding, and as his bride-to-be was coming down the middle aisle, they stopped the music, he turned around and sang to her as she walked on the aisle, I love you with the love of the Lord. Something that I'll never forget as long as I live. And little did I know that less than three years later, I was sitting in that same building, but this time watching his lovely bride, his lovely wife, sing, say her final goodbyes to him and sing, I love you with the love of the Lord. For reasons known only to him and God, he took his own life. I, uh, that shook my faith to its foundations. I, I didn't know what to do. I, uh, I was lost. I was thoroughly lost. And I, you know, in a verse in James, James 1, verses 3 and 4, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let per perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. My, my faith was tested so hard that for quite a few, quite a long time, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't attending church. And I realized then, at that time, trying to establish a relationship with God, or even trying to reestablish a relationship with God, going through a crisis like, a crisis like that is not the time you want to do that. It's your daily walk with God every day, how you're in the scripture, how you're meditating, how you're praying ceasingly, that's what gets you through the crisis. So, I was questioning God, I was saying, Lord, how could you just stand by and let that happen? And I started thinking about my relationship at the time, and it struck me, God never left. He was always there, I'm the one who left. And I thought about, well, where was God when this happened? God is in the same place he's always been. He was standing right there with open arms, loving arms, waiting for me. The same day that my friend did that, God was there also with loving open arms, just waiting. And he was there in the same place the day he watched as his son came down to this earth. We, people just like us spit in his face, stuck a crown of thorns on his head, beat him beyond any human recognition, and nailed him to a cross and watched him die. That's where God was. God never leaves. During the time I was uh, not going to church, I'd still go by and visit my mom and dad. And my dad would always say, well, we miss you at church today. You know you should have been there. And he'd say, son, you know we didn't teach you that growing up. I said, yeah, I know I can learn that all on my own. But, uh, and for one, this particular day, it didn't sit well with me. And I, I chose to say, well, what makes, what makes you think you're any better off than I am because you're down at that church building sitting in a pew and I'm not there? And he just looked at me sadly and he says, I don't think I've ever said to you that I thought I was better off. I think the Lord God and his words to us tells us how important it is that we gather together every day. Now, a verse that I've heard millions of times in my life, and he asked me to read again, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold on firmly to the hope we profess, because we can trust God to keep his promise. Let us be concerned for one another 
to help one another, to show love, and to do good. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together, as some are. For, for the first time in my life, that took on a whole different meaning. I always thought, people always say to me, well, what a hypocrite. I don't go to church. But church is just full of a bunch of hypocrites. And I couldn't agree with, I couldn't disagree with that anymore. For once in my life, I realized what church is all about. It's just a bunch of sinners, broken people just like myself, who come together to give each other encouragement, to give each other praise, to pray for each other, to be there, to laugh, to cry together, to motivate each other. That's what a church is about. I always thought also you had to be perfect to be a Christian. There's only one soul that ever was perfect to walk in the face of this earth. And he came here for one reason, to die for us so that we wouldn't have to be perfect. And at this stage of my life where I'm at now, I can't even begin to imagine what it would be like in my life to not have my Christian family. You guys helped me endure so many obstacles that we face. We we're all have temptations and trials we face every day of our lives and because of people like you, we all get through it. I still think about my dad every day. It's been 22 years, and there's not a day go by that I don't think about my dad. My dad, uh, I, I think about things that I said to him that I wish I never had said. And I think about things I wish I had said that I didn't say. Uh, there's not enough money in this world that I would give to just have 10 minutes to sit down with my dad right now and just talk with him. But I know I'm going to have that opportunity to give it again. I know I am because my goal is to get to that place. My dad was a, not a very verbal type person, but he, he, he led by the way he led his life, by his, his actions. He taught me lots of good things growing up. He taught me good work ethic, how to treat people right. But the biggest thing he taught me was to be faithful in what you believe in. And Revelation 2.10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. There again, that's the Son of God telling us that. And there's no doubt in my mind, my dad was faithful until death. And that's my goal. And I believe for sure it's everybody's goal sitting here today. That's our ultimate goal. So this morning there's two choices and two verses I'd like to leave you with. And I hope that you write these verses down and during the course of the upcoming weeks, and months, and days, you reread them, read them and reread them and reread them again. Examine your own heart, check deep inside you, your own soul, and see how those, these verses affect you. And if they, if they happen to affect you adversely, work on that relationship with God. 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, but also all who have longed for his appearing. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. And it's wonderful that glorious as that verse is, the exact polar opposite is the most frightening thing I can think of. In Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons? And in your name perform miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. I don't know about you, but that's words I never want to hear from Jesus Christ. So, please just uh, study those scriptures and, and keep them with you this week. Finally, uh, my goal this morning was to Get each and every one of us.
us is to slow down. The old saying, just stop and smell the roses. I hear it so much in my life, and I say it so much in my life, there's just not enough hours of the day to get to done, done what I have to get done. But it shouldn't be just the opposite. We should cherish every second of every moment we have every day. Because we're not promised we're going to get up in the morning. I, I hope that we all do this. I, I'm, I'm the worst of worst when it comes to living in the present. I'm always thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to do this time next week, what's going to go on. And so I'm going to be the first to share this. I was not planning this. I'm going to be the first to share this with you. I have a confession to make. Most of you know that every Thursday I go off with two friends here. We've been doing this for, gosh, 13, 14 years. And I'd say not even, it just so happens the place we golf has, golf is called Paradise. And uh, I'd say 95% of the time when we golf, we have a great time. 5% of the time, golf gets in the way, and no, so not so much fun. But I'm ashamed to say that over those 13, 14 years, I have never told Luz and never told Jay how much I love them and how much their friendship means to me. They're such godly men, and they, they love the Lord with all their heart. And I just take that for granted. I just take for granted that next Thursday I'm going to see him and we're going to play golf. And I don't want to do that anymore. I want to tell people when I see them and when I admire somebody for doing something, I want to tell them right then and there. So this morning, when you go home, I pray to God that you get your family together and tell them how much you love them. We're not promised tomorrow. And I don't care if they live out of state. Don't say, well, I'll wake up, I'll, I'll wait till tomorrow afternoon and call them, because you might not wake up tomorrow. So wherever your family's at, wrap your loving arms around them, tell them how much you love them, and how much they mean to you, because you don't want regrets. So this morning, if there, for any reason, if you need the prayers of the congregation, or you just have some prayers answered that you'd like to express to people, or if you have a desire, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian and you desire to be baptized, I'd ask you now to come together, come forward as we stand and sing.
I've been wanting to do this sooner, and at first I wanted to be the one reading this, but I really shy to get on stage. People who do this all the time are really gifted because getting on stage and talking in front of people is not an easy thing to do, amen. <laughs> so I ask, I decided to ask my dear brother Wayne to give, the, give me the honor and do this in my place. So now I want to ask you something. Have you ever asked yourself, who is the Church of Christ? Let me tell each and every one of you, you are the church. I know only a few people might know how God led me to this beautiful church, and I hope and pray that someday I will be able to tell you all how God honored me to be among you today. I just want to tell you that I love each and every one of you so much that words can, can't describe. And yes, I know I didn't have the pleasure to know everyone, but I love you anyway. Almost seven years ago, October 9, 2007, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ chose me to be one of his servants. I started asking about God since I was only three years old and kept searching and searching until the day finally came. I'm not proud of anything about myself except one thing, and that is in all my entire life, even as a Muslim, I always loved God the Creator. As a believer in God, I knew there was something missing. The most important thing that the Muslims take out of the equation is Jesus Christ. And that was the only reason that, even though I did believe in God, there was always something missing. That is why I searched and searched until the glorious day finally arrived. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, now lives in me and I have been chosen. Please remember that each and every one of you who is in Christ today are chosen. So let's all, bo let's all boast about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who is among us right now at this time. I can tell you one other thing, that I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. Galatians 2.20 says that the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Isn't that the same fact for all of us? I just want to tell you that I couldn't ask for any better church than Magnolia Church of Christ. I wouldn't change my church, not even to the most famous church in the world, and even if everyone goes against me and even mocks me, I will stand, I would stand firm and I would leave this home for anything. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. We have to remember when God leads us to be somewhere, that somewhere for me is, this, is the most beautiful place. But there are times in my life, at least in my life, that God lets Satan use our loved ones against us, and I learned that the hard way. God uses people, even loved ones in our life, to change us. And I, when I focus on myself and try to be, be the best that God wants me to be, then there wouldn't be any anger or hostility. I just concentrate on ch changing myself. I always pray that even if he decides to test me more, that at the end I would be exactly who he wants me to be. I'm ready for more unfair things and tests. It would be all worth it. I just want to ask you all a favor. As we are alone, our church is going through changes, and that can be sad and frustrating. But this is the time that we all need each other, and we all need to pray more and more. And the beauty comes, and the beauty comes at the end when we look back and say, "Yes, we did it." Actually, let's start again and look back and say, "Yes, God got us through the hard times." I have so much faith in each and every one of the church, and that only God knows. You are all fighters. You are amazing people, and I'm honored to be among you as part of this church. I hope someday God gives me this opportunity to tell the whole world about my testimony and what a great God we serve. God bless you all, and please don't forget how important each and every one of you are to me. Let's, let's pray. Lord, you truly are an awesome God. We just love you and we thank you for watching over us. We thank you for your love, your mercy your forgiveness, your kindness. We thank you mostly for the greatest gift you ever gave us, your son, who came down here and died for us, that we can spend an eternity with you. Lord, I thank you so much for bringing Mitra into my life. She's been such a blessing to me. We talk a lot. And this woman is so full of love that it just amazes me. She wants, I tell her sometimes, Mitra, you just learn, need to learn how to say no. You can't do everything. But she thinks she's it's her job to heal everybody. So Lord, just 
This morning, just wrap your loving arms around Peter like you never have before. Let her feel your love and your presence. Take the burden off her that she doesn't have to save and conquer the world that you love her. Lord, again, just thank you so much for this morning and thank you for the opportunity you gave me. We ask all this in your son's most holy name. In just a moment, we'll conclude our service with a song and a prayer, and the help will give us the prayer. And again, I just want to thank Wayne for reading Mitra's testimony. She's been wanting to say this before you for, for many months. And here's a humble lady that loves, loves this place, loves the worship here. And one other thing I want to say is that I don't think we need to look any further. Wayne, is, if it's up to me, you're hired. <laughs>
God, our Heavenly Father. We thank you for the gathering here today as your church. We offer our sacrifice of prayer and worship because you are our creator. You have fed us a great lesson from Wayne today, Father. We're thankful for that and for all the things that he gave us to uh, gather into our hearts and uh, live them out in our lives, in our daily lives as we go about your work. Father, may we continue to worship, to praise, and to lift up our voices and prayers as we leave this place and bring all that we've heard into our daily lives. May our lives be sustained through the love that we have for you, our Heavenly Father. And as we go from this place, may we continue to know your presence and the power in your word so that it will make a difference in our lives that we leave. 